Well, I think talking about Ebola, I mean, the, the risk, it's all a matter of geography, really. I mean, I think that people in the world don't understand how big Africa is. You can get the whole of India, the whole of the United States, the whole of Eastern and Western Europe into Africa. And the Ebola scare is confined to three countries in West Africa. Um, and of course, those countries are not really tourism. They're not, so. but I would say that very close by, we do have members, because I run the Trade Association, we do have members in Senegal, which is very close by. So we have great sympathy with them, but obviously tourism there is, is desperate. But this Ebola has been contained um, in West Africa. And you have to understand that just from, say, West Africa to Kenya, um, it's three and a half thousand miles. From West Africa to South Africa is much, much further. Whereas it is closer to go to, with uh, the Ebola is closer to New York, London, Madrid, than it is to um, East and Southern Africa, as you say, Southern uh, Sub Saharan Africa. So therefore, um, I don't think it is justified. And I do think this has been a media frenzy. And I do think as a result, um, the tourism industry, as you rightly say, has been devastated. Um, I've just returned yesterday from Kenya, and the beaches are empty. I mean, the sun is still shining, the beaches are golden sand, and the sea is blue, but there are no tourists there at all. Well, that's not as a result of Ebola. It's partly due to Ebola. It's got its own problem. problems with, with, with terrorism. Um, but again, I think that's been slightly blown by the Foreign Office. Um, but going back to the Ebola thing, uh, it is affecting all the countries. And so, so how are they being affected? Because so many people rely on tourism, don't they, for yeah. their livelihood? Yeah. So they're being affected by the fact that there are absolutely no tourists. And one, your point is absolutely valid. You know, one in 20 jobs in, in Africa comes from tourism. And if you take that equation out, and there are a lot of people um, without work who will then um, look for other, other things to do if they can't go into tourism. This is extremely serious. And... Tourism is not just really about the one in 20, it's about all the other things that are combined with it. I mean, if you're a hotel, you've got to buy eggs and things like that. So all those people are counted in. So it is a massive number of people affected. And tourism is very much down, so down as much as 40% in East Africa, probably slightly less so in, in Southern Africa. And how has it affected your members? Well, it's affected them very, very badly because, because they have very, very little income. And they're all desperately trying to keep things going. Um, because, as you rightly say, they are supporting the communities around them. And secondly, where the model that's been run out so much now in East Africa is, is to involve local communities with game. I mean, the alternative is if you don't have game, you're going to have cattle in. And we're trying desperately to keep the game going in, in, in East Africa. Now, if that all falls apart and there are no tourists, then they can't keep to the pledges they've made to the locals, say Masai Mara, to pay them a bed night fee or pay them fees for the tourists, because there's no income, they were uh, unable to pay that. So then, eventually what will happen is, I suppose, they'll go back to the traditional cattle farming, which will drive the, the wild game away. What about countries like Zimbabwe and the Gambia, which, of course, in the case of Zimbabwe, has beautiful tourist spots, tourist falls, for example. But some tourists might think, because of the regimes in those places, they don't want to go there because they have some political reasons for not going there. Is that the right thing to do, or does that really affect people on the ground then? No, I don't think it does affect people at all. Um, Zimbabwe is having a huge revival in tourism now. In fact, it's one of our sort of key focuses at, at the moment. And if I say that in Vic Falls, there's now over 60% occupancy. It's, things are going very, very well, and it's all being restored. Um, it, it's had its bad times. But so, again, did South Africa 10, 12 years ago, and look where they've come from. I mean, they have the, probably one of the best um, tourism products in not just the game, but they have wine farm, wine lands, and uh, you can go and see things about the struggle, which is, of course, very important about it. You can, you can do so many things in South Africa. So they've got a very diverse product, and I don't think politics does come into these things. And it's very often when you get elections, of course, then there is the problems, and Kenya saw that one. But again, it was rolling news that sort of spread that again and again, the same in images of, of, you know, quite restricted um, violence on the streets. Right. And that rolling news would cause the problem with tourism. So what would your advice be to people who want to go to Africa now? What would you tell them? Well, the bad thing is how you book. So you need to book through a credible tour operator because you need to make certain that your money is secure if anything goes wrong as you do to going anywhere in the world. So that's the first part of it. And then I think select what you want to do, select the country you want, and, um, and, and go to Africa. Go and see what it's like. It's the most wonderful place. And um, 
as Karen Blixen said, you know, the one place you need to wake up is in Africa. It's the most vibrant, most wonderful place you can go to. And so I, I say, get booking now. Come and see what's going on in Africa. I would agree with you. I've just come back from Africa. Nigel Verdickel, Chief Executive of the African Travel and Tourism Association. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.